how the heck did you write three complete novels, like 1,200 pages, before you even had a publishing deal? So I was just sort of a secret geek. When one of my best friends found out I was writing a novel, he mocked me. I'll work all day and I look at it. That was dumb. I've seen that in a movie before. I have the ultimate get rich quick scheme for your fans. Everyone, everyone, shh, shh, shh. Okay, okay, we're ready. I have no plan B. How the heck do you write an entire trilogy that goes on to be New York Times bestsellers before it's even published? Oh, well, I have the ultimate get rich quick scheme for your fans. And if they've tuned in, here's what you do. Like I, I started writing at 13 and by the time I was 30, I was making minimum wage. So that's all it takes. You so just... all it takes is 17 years of being focused and being committed and going to school for it and going to England and Oxford and like reading poetry and like working away at it just without any payoff. And then suddenly it works. That's pretty much the trick. That's the whole thing. So if you're actually committed in a literal sense, that that's also helpful too. Short stints in asylums are wonderful for you. So uh, yeah, honestly, it's about knowing what you love and following that. And then unfortunately, it's about putting in the work to try to follow it and see how far it can take you. Oh, I love it. We're going to talk about commitment a lot, I think, today. Because... I have to imagine when you were 13 and you decide, you know, I want to be an author. I don't know what type of writer you wanted to be and I'd love to hear from you, but you must have had a romanticized version of what being an author was compared to like what you actually signed up for. That's kind of yes and kind of no. So the first guy I ran into was oh, we 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 we've, we've got a a visual cue. So can any, <laughs> anybody take a guess who that might be? Yeah, that's Edgar Allan Poe. So, action figure. Just for our audio listeners, he has a, an action figure. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a very old uh, Edgar Allan Poe action figure that somebody gave to me. So, when I was in seventh grade, I was a very lonely kid. My parents had sort of moved me around to a lot of schools. I was an introvert. Kind of took me a couple of years to make friends. And unfortunately, my parents would move me around every year. So that was rough. And in seventh grade, I, I read Edgar Allan Poe and he. He expressed things about just the human condition through his writing. Like, like he expressed isolation. He expressed loneliness. He expressed like feeling underappreciated, like nobody knew who he was or, or no, nobody, nobody appreciated him. And I felt like, wait, somebody has felt these feelings that I feel before. Like, I am not the only human on earth who has felt these things, which is really obvious as an adult. But in seventh grade, I would like talk to people and be like, have you ever felt like absolute devastation at our existence in the world? And they'd look at me and just be like, no, no, I never have. And you're like, I'm weird. And, yeah, and, this is and, like also like what? You're born in 70. This is like 1992, right? Yeah, so. sure, right. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> A very fraught time in our history. <laughs> The Cold War was over. Like, we'd won. Everything was great. <laughs> and there's a little break. So, so, so Edgar Allan Poe at least made me feel not weird. So because I knew he was weird. I knew he was really weird. I knew we wouldn't be friends if he'd still been alive. I, I mean, I had that much like this dude's weird. But actually, he's expressing something. And he kind of became he kind of became a friend to me, which I knew was magical. It's like this dude has been dead for 100, 150 years. And he's being a friend to me. And I thought, that is amazing. So I grabbed my dad's. He had like a, a first generation, like 25 pound Mac laptop. And I would steal it and I would, I would go downstairs and I would write for hours every day. And that's pretty much what my life is now. So in, in a way, I have not a romantic view at all because I just knew I wanted to do that thing. I wanted to connect to people. I wanted to help other people. I wanted to, us to not be alone in the universe. And so in a way... I also knew nobody gets to make a living doing this. Like Poe couldn't do it and he was brilliant. I figured that would never happen for me. Really? So at what point kind of in your writing did it go from being something you just wanted to do to the actual idea that this is something you could do? Oh, um, <laughs> when I was uh, today years old, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on, man. <laughs> You've been you've been a professional writer now for like 15 years. So mm -hmm. I mean you've been writing a very long time before that. Yeah. I was saying to my producer actually before the recording where I was like if if at any point anyone in the audience thinks like, "Oh, you know, 
You just showed up. Like here you are. You just showed up and you put out a best selling book. It's like, well, let's not ignore the 17 years that went into it before that, right? <laughs> right. And, so there must have been a point though, you know, in your teenage years, you're 16, 17, 18, or you're in university or you're or going to college or whatever, where you're like, you know what? This person came along, they said this thing, or I had this idea, or this actually could be the thing. Yeah. No? Yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time um you know, I I went through high school. I became a little bit of a jock. You know, I was I did well in sports. I started. I had that connection with other people that was a little more normal and and more socially acceptable. And so I was just sort of a secret geek. And back in you know the early '90s, like being a geek wasn't cool. Like it's not like now. Like the geeks won. And that's great and everything. But back then, it was like, oh, you're the people who don't shower and like, nobody likes you. But when when one of my best friends found out I was writing a novel, he mocked me, you know, like he made up a name for me. Oh, novel boy. You know, he called me like, that's the most creative he could come up with. So that, that's kind of sad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're like, I could write an insult better than that. <laughs> so I, I, I tried to do normal things. I tried to do, I, I was like, you know what? I can think, I can speak, I can, I, I have some gifts, I can study. Um, and I, I, I think in Siddhartha uh, by Herman Hesse, but like, like Siddhartha says, you know, I, I can think, I, I can read and, and I can be hungry. And, and so he thought he could do anything, which, which he was, you know, well, he became Buddha. So that for him, I guess. But I, I was like, I have gifts, I can do things. So I knew that the writing thing would never work out. I knew that like, just statistically, it's like the average writer who puts on their little IRS form that they're a writer that like, and they submit that like the, the average that they make in a year is $8,000. And those are the people who are like, following it, you know, who dare to put that on their little IRS form. Oh, what is, what's your job? I'm a writer, you know, you know, um, so, so I, I was pretty sure that it was not a thing that would happen. And so I looked for something else that could make me happy because I was like, well, let's not waste our whole lives. Right. And then I tried to back burner that. I thought about other things. It was like nothing, nothing really filled that niche for me, that itch. Um, and so I went to Oxford for just for a semester. There's lots of exchange programs. And I took a I took a creative writing class over there and sat in Tolkien and Lewis's old pub, the Eagle and Child. They call it the Bird and the Baby. And I'd been fans of both of theirs. Of course, Tolkien was a huge part of my journey. So I'd sit there and I'd write up my story for the week. And I turned it in and I knew it was crap every time. I knew my stories were bad, but everybody else in my class was like, Your stories are so good. And I was like, Really? Really? Like, okay, well, hold on. What did they see that you didn't then? Well, it's, it's, I, I think they were grading on a curve and I wasn't, you, you know, like I've been reading the best stuff that, that people have ever written. And so th there's this thing that Ira Glass talks about and, and he talks about the gap. And every young artist faces this thing. It's like you have good taste. That is going to be incredibly helpful to you for all of your life. Because taste is what helps you recognize good work. But at the beginning, you cannot make good work. So there's this gap between what you're able to create and what you know is good. And it's painful. It hurts. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, there's a gap. I am painfully aware of this gap. And everybody else is like, dude, your stuff is the best thing in the class. And so I, I had this crazy idea. I was like, you know what? When you're young and you're just out of college, like you're allowed to be poor. Like it's okay. You, you know, people sort of expect, oh, you're young and poor. Like that's fine. It's socially acceptable. And so I thought, y you know what? <laughs> I really want to do this thing. Some people think I'm really good. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to be young and poor. And I'm just going to do it now. I'll see that I'm bad. I'll finish a novel or something. And, and then I'll see that it's terrible. And then I'll be able to put that away and just be like, okay, fine that's out of my system. And now I can go have a normal life and make money and, and, and have a job and do that sort of thing. And I thought, otherwise, if I get a job first, I'll be waiting until I retire. And then if I find out I can't write by the time I retire, it's like, well, what if I, I've been dreaming the wrong thing for 40 years? So I thought, I'll just do it first. I'll just do it first. It'll be fine. And so I graduated from college and I just got a day job, well, sort of a night job. I worked at a bar and I started writing. And then I I, I ran into this this girl, she 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 emailed me from my past. Um, 
the, the, the girl who would become your wife who you met when you were 12? Yes, yes. So she was there from the very beginning, actually. So it was in, in seventh grade. I met the two great loves of my life, Edgar Allan Poe. And then I would read Poe stories. I had a teacher, uh, Nancy Helgeth. Who would, who would let us come into her classroom and have lunch in her classroom. And then she would let me read. She's like, why don't you read some of those stories out loud? So I'd read Edgar Allan Poe to the class. And one of the, one of the girls in the class was, was Christina Barnes. And man, she was gorgeous and she was smart and I liked her. Eventually a ninth grader asked her out and she, she turned me down flat. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the underdog story. Yeah, 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 it was all there. All the pieces were there. And then, um, yeah, so after college, she sends me um, an email and I'm like, wait, this is you know, Christy Barnes still? Like I thought she went to like a Christian college and I thought like part of the deal was it, you know, r- ring by spring or your money back. <laughs> so she, I was surprised she was still not married. And she, I was like, oh, she has finally opened her eyes. She now sees me. She wants me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And so I answered the email. Eventually, she called me. I'm like, man, she is really ratcheting this up. She is so after me. And I went out and visited. And she'd had no idea. She just, she had no idea I was interested. Somehow she was, she was completely blind. Um, and when I sort of asked her if, if she'd, you know, be my girlfriend, she's like, not, no. <laughs> so... Not no. That's Not better no. than the grade nine rejection. Yes, it? yes. So I went from no in ninth grade to not no at twenty two, and 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 then uh, or twenty yeah, and then to to yes when I asked her to marry me. So eventually she became aware of my obvious charms. So. <laughs> I, she's a little slow. I I could say that because she's not here, so she might tell the story a little differently. <laughs> can Can you help me understand? I just, I can't figure out, maybe I'm trying to simplify too much. I can't figure out how you can love writing and you can love it so much that you keep doing it and you keep finding yourself pursuing it and trying it and yet still not believe that you're capable of doing this professionally. I just, I don't understand. (laughs) Right. Uh, Well, um, because I want you to be the guy who's like, at 13, I picked this. And I knew right. from that moment I would never give up. And yet, it's like, like that's not the case at all. Your story is actually much more real and human than that uh, like person who's like, I'm going to do this come hell or high water. I Yes, I hope so. Because I realized like, I come here with this tremendous... I mean, you, you say it, it sounds like you don't have it. But I come here with tremendous humility. It's like, I'm an outlier. Like When people come to me and they're like, hey, I want to be a writer. I say, okay, well, understand, you're talking to a guy who's making a living doing this. And most people don't. You know, and I sell best selling books and most people don't. So if you don't love writing, if you don't love the act of it, like there are better ways to make a living and easier ways. And writing is incredibly difficult. You do not know what the payoff is going to be. So if you don't love it, don't do it. Find something else. Like if you're perfectly happy, you know, some like, oh, I've got, I can play music on the side or, or I can, I can write little stories for my, for a play in the community theater once a year. And otherwise I'm really happy having sane coworkers and a good boss and, and having a 401k. It's like, man, if, if those things can make you happy and you can scratch that itch, you know, one hour a week and do that because this life, it's the perfect incubator for paranoia. Like all the things that control your life are thousands of miles away. You can make a book like mine. And that I really thought like I had this thing in my head. I was like, I would read books and I'd be like, I'm better than that. My book is better than that. But then I always had in my head, what if I'm wrong? You know, there's those guys who go on American Idol who's like, I'm the best singer ever. And you're like, (laughs) and they sing and you're like, dude, how have you made it to 28 thinking you can sing? Because you're awful. And so I always had that in my head of, of like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm that guy. Like, I don't think I'm that guy, but but maybe I am. So there's a certain mental flexibility, which, of course, helps me write numerous characters, right? Like, I can write characters honestly who are on different sides of contentious issues, who are, you know, somebody's got faith and somebody doesn't have faith. And can I write both of those people well? Can I write them honestly? Somebody has a different philosophical system of the world. Can I write that person honestly? Can I really put myself in that person's shoes? Well, yes, I can. Unfortunately, I can do it in my own life, too. Like, what if I'm wrong about me? That's scary. I decided to do it. I decided to follow it. My girlfriend, I proposed to her. I've been teaching. I taught for a year after the bar. After I attended, attended bar, I taught for a year. During that time, I really love teaching. I really like teaching a lot. 
And I only had a few times where I had time to write. And I would get to a weekend where I had some time to write. I'd sit down in front of the keyboard and I was dry. I had nothing to say. I, the creativity bucket was completely used by teaching. And, and I, I had a really hard like teaching load and being a first year teacher is just, is just hard <laughs> anyway. But like that made me feel dead and scared. And I was like, oh, I really, really want to do this writing thing. Like I love teaching, but I don't love being a teacher. That's not who I am. Like that's not my shape and identity. It's like, I can teach. My kids thought I was a great teacher. I enjoyed them. I love those kids. Didn't love all their parents, but... But, uh, did, you know, didn't love grading papers, but I love the kids and, and I love being part of their world. And when you're working with kids who are teenagers, like they are in that identity formation part of their lives. That is awesome. It is such a privilege to be part of people's lives in that time. Like, who am I going to be? You can help them discover that. That's so powerful. And it wasn't for me. So I loved it that many ways. And I knew it wasn't who I was. Uh, so I was like, man, I, I really want to write. I don't know how to make it happen. And my wife was like, you know, let me work the day job and let's do this writing thing. And so, so, uh, so we did that and it was, it was kind of terrifying. So I, I knew I'd be telling this story and, and I often shy from telling the whole truth about this story because I know as soon as I do, you know, we're on YouTube here, right? Like, like three quarters of the people are just going to be done because I'm a, they're 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 gonna click. So 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 you better hide this somewhere because we're losing it. <laughs> okay. So thank you everyone for coming. Everyone, everyone. Shh, shh, shh. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're ready. So the thing is, like, I didn't believe in myself this much. So I believed in what I was doing. And Mark Twain has this quote: like, the problem with so many self-made men is that they worship their creator. <laughs> So there are a lot of writers who do believe in themselves so much because you have to to make it past all the rejection. And I actually don't like I believe in what I'm doing. And for me, there was a faith piece to this. Like, I felt like this is what God told us to do. And it was like, I would ask for, you know, a book deal. And instead, I would get encouragement. No, keep doing this. Keep doing this. And it got really old. It was like, I would want to give up. I'd be like, man, this sucks. The price is too high. Like I wasn't just paying the price. Like that's the thing. We think that only the dreamer pays the price. And it's like, that's not true. My wife was paying the price. Like we're sitting there watching our friends, you know, obviously that get, get married. Now they've got an SUV. Now they've got an SUV and a dog. Now they've got an SUV and a dog in a house. And we're still sitting in the little apartment next to the projects, which was fine. It was the projects in Oregon. It wasn't like like in in a small town in Oregon. It, it wasn't, it wasn't like the projects of New York or Detroit. Yeah, or yeah, there were no shootings. It was literally you know Section Eight housing, but you know it wasn't like this this grim grim picture. Like, but you know, I had a buddy graduate from Harvard Law, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to go get a job. You know, it'd been like okay, I was 25. I, I'm doing this full time. 26. I'm doing this full time. 27, 28, 29. This is not cute anymore. And there's no triumphant ending guaranteed. Like there's people who just live crappy lives, you know, and and like, why do I think I'm so special? Like, why do I think I get the good ending? Right? That would be great. It would be a great story if I did. But you don't get a guarantee that you're going to get that. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, this price is heavy. And we just kept feeling like we got encouragement, we're supposed to do this. And so so we just kept going. And and I'd be like, God, I don't want encouragement. I want a book deal. <laughs> you know? I want so, what so, I want the way I want it when I want it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And we had this long circuitous route to getting the deal. And I originally, so after about a year, I, I thought it was after the first year of this. So we'd been married for a year. I'd written the book. I'd rewritten the book. Uh, I was kind of the house husband. So I'd make the, I'd make all the meals. I'd clean up the apartment and she'd come home and I'd have dinner ready. And that's kind of, you know, how we broke things up. I'd make breakfast in the morning and I'd make her a little lunch. And, and, you how know, many hours a day would you write at the time? Um, you, you, you know, I'd probably write six or seven hours a day. Wow. And that's about as much as you can write before, like your creativity tank is only so full. Like you can fiddle around for more hours, but a lot of people like the actual writing is about four hours a day. And then, I mean, once you're published, there's like stuff to do with the rest of your day because you sort of take on another job. You've got the writing and then you've got the like all the stuff to sell the books and talk to fans and do all that stuff. So I would write. I had a pretty good life, but like not making any income and never know when it's going to happen. So I sent out my query to 30 agents. I found 30 agents 
who I would be happy to have represent me. And this is an incredibly important relationship in your, in your life. They say you can tell a writer's in trouble when he gets a divorce or when she gets a divorce. And you can tell a writer's really in trouble when they switch agents. <laughs> so, so, so that's how important that relationship is because your agent is the person who is your you know umbilical cord to New York. This is places. like a literary agent. So their yes. main job is to be able to take your book, package it, and go to the different publishers to try and sell it and get it for the best price. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's that's what they do. And then they negotiate any, any disputes you have or or like any troubles you have. Like like once you get published, they keep working for you and they keep selling it. It's definitely worth the 15% that they charge you, especially if you get a good one. So I went to a um I went to a writer's conference. There was a writer's conference, a Willamette Writers Conference. It was local, cost four hundred dollars to go to. We almost didn't go because it was just like 400 bucks was a lot of money for us. I went to it because there were two agents there who on paper looked good for me. And the first one was like, oh man, she's weird. She is, she is not the same kind of weird that I am. She is a different (laughs) kind of weird than me. I admit I'm weird, but like she's a whole different, you know, kettle of fish. So I was like, not a match for me. And then the other one was, was this guy, he gave a talk and, and he said, what's one thing your main character would never do. Uh, so I sit there and I, I think about it. If any writers in the audience, go ahead and pause here and think about it. Once one thing your main character would never do. Said, now, what happens to your book if he does it? And I was like, <gasps> that's so like Kyler. He would never betray his master. He'd never do it. Just wouldn't happen. So I'd come. I was ready to pitch my book. I thought I was done. And I was like, this bastard, I'm not done with my book. I got to go rework everything. (laughs) You're like, how can I engineer it so my characters can betray their very, uh, uh, what would you call principles? (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. Well, because what it makes you do is, is say, how do you take that character to the end of themselves? It's like, okay, what's a thing that they absolutely believe in? How can you put them in a situation where they have to question that thing? Where's the point where Brent gives up on his dream? What happens? Because there's got to be something that happens to make him make that choice. At least in fiction, there's got to be something that happens. Because, you you know, we like to have dynamic moments in fiction. So he said that. I was like, ah, crap. I, I pitched him my novel anyway. I completely, I completely screwed it up it was terrible he he looked at me and he was confused yeah he gave me that look like i was like oh god i blew it and um but during our talks they basically say if you're there you know go ahead and send us your book say that you met me here and so i went i rewrote it i sent it to him you know six months later i said hey i met you at the thing And, and i sent this at the time that i sent it out to 30 other agents um 15 of them I slowly collected rejection letters from 15 of those. Man, if you're an agency, like, don't do this to people. They took a rubber stamper. They stamped my own letter. They put it in the envelope and they sent it back to me. Like, they didn't even give me a piece of paper saying it was rejection. It was a stamp. Thank you. No. So, you you know, some other gibberish on there. Uh, uh, Another place would send like a little fraction of paper, like this big. Like, you're not worth a full eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. We're going to send you just this snippet because we don't want to waste paper on you, buddy. You're not worth. So you said, okay, this is the part where everyone's going to stop listening. Everyone's going to click. Everyone's going to bail on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And yet, I don't think so. I don't think so because what you're explaining is the truth that yeah. if you want to be successful like you, if you want to be in the NBA, if you want to be in the NFL, if you want to be Steve Jobs, if you want to launch that business, if you want to be the actor, if you want to be in Hollywood, no matter what it is, one, it's an extremely competitive sport at the top. Yeah. The only people who can get there are the people who are willing to put in the years of work and grind and effort. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like, hey, only do this if you're guaranteed a spot at the top. It's if you want a shot at your dream coming true, you have to be willing to do it. Yeah. I think that's optimistic. I think that's hopeful, isn't it? I mean, like, it's good to me to know, like, hey, if I'm willing to put in the work and I love it and it's, and I'm going to develop my craft and I'm going to commit to this and I'm just going to keep going year after year after year. I mean, you might have been 70 by the time your first book got published. But if you never gave up along the way, I have to imagine those 50 years of working in, you know, in solitude would eventually pay off. No? Yeah, I absolutely think so. And I mean, but it's like, there's, 
there's, you know, there's ways to succeed and there's ways to keep writing. And so for me to ask the full sacrifice from my wife, like I and and from myself, you know, it's like, okay, our life is kind of on hold. We don't want to have kids when we have no income, right? It's like, I needed to have something to believe in. And that something just wasn't me. It, it was like, I think I write well enough that I can be a published writer. I think I could do very well, actually, at writing. I think that's true. I'm pretty sure that's true. Like I'm sending it to people and they're rejecting me. So they don't believe it, but I think it's true. But there is great work that gets overlooked all the time. There are great writers who are only recognized as great after they're dead, you know? So like that thing where there's no guaranteed happy ending was just in my mind. And that wasn't all, you know, self doubt. That was just like, man, the world is rough, you know? And there's some great people who deserve to make it. And don't, you know, I went to high school with a guy who's a fantastic athlete and he should have been playing college ball and he just gets an injury, you know, and it's like he gets an ankle injury and he doesn't go to the doctor because he's poor and he doesn't heal right. And it's just like he doesn't play college ball. The dude should have been in the NFL for a year or two. You know, he, he wouldn't have been a great, great of all time. But it's like, dang, like life is like that. So I just had this thing like where it came down to is like, why am I not quitting when this seems ridiculous? Is like, I think this is what I'm made to do. I think this is what God has told me to keep doing. Only one person ever asked me, you know, what's your plan B? And I said, I have no plan B. I love that. I take hope in that. Like, <laughs> and so, so, so was it hard work or was it luck or both? Well, 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 well so, I mean, I mean, that that's, that's the backside of this. I don't think it was luck. I mean, I got, I got with Don and so, so Don eventually accepted my book. All the other agents dumped. He was my number one choice. He was the last guy I had to hear from. So I'm waiting to hear from an agent. He's the best agent on my list. I know he's the hardest to get into. I think he gets he gets 10,000 queries a year. So 10,000 people have written a novel, say, I want you to re represent my novel. He gets that many. And he takes on three people a year. So, I, so I, I knew that my chances with him were dim. Everybody had said no. So every like a few people had asked, hey, we want to see more. They asked for more. I sent them more. This is over months of time. And then Don is the last person on my list. And I'm like, man, if Don says no, I might have to talk to my buddy who's got a job for me at the insurance agency. You know, like, like it might be time to think about that. And that's the other thing I, uh, so, so, and then Don said, yes, he's like, yeah, well, I, I didn't know if we were ready to send it straight to the publisher. He's like, it's really great. Or whether we were, we're going to work on some things first before we send it there. So, so then I knew we'd have a quick turnaround. We'd sell the book immediately. And it took two more years. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, uh, after a year, we ran into this guy, he had, he had seen this thing. So I get done with the book, right? I think it's sellable. The smart thing to do. And, and like what Brandon Sanderson did, who I'm sure, sure some of your people have heard of is he wrote book one in a bunch of different series, right? Because then you got more lines in the water. So, so the absolute rational thing to do, because if no publisher buys book one, there's no point for two, or there's three. no point for writing book two. So I was like, I know what the smart thing to do is. I, I went to my wife. I said, I know the smart thing is to write a, a first book in a different series so I can double my odds. I said, but I'm just really passionate about these characters. And, and she's like, you have to write what you're passionate about. And so I was like, okay. So I started writing book two, even though I knew it was stupid. So I'm almost done writing book two. And Don introduced me to this editor. The guy's like, you know, oh, sweet, you're almost done. He's like, I've got this idea. He's like, I've got this cool thing we can do. You get done with book three. He's like, I'm still reading book two. He's like, I'm putting together a package. I'm going to, you know, present this to the team and we're going to sell this. Um, I said, we can publish them all quickly. He said, this has been done in like romance. Romance has done this. And they kind of did it once with, with our US writer and the, they published her quickly in the UK. It really launched her quickly. He's like, so, so we'll do this thing. He's like, I think it'll work really great. And so he was putting together the package to, to put an offer in. And then he got downsized. He just disappears. <laughs> and, and then it took him another year. So, so, so I'm in there. I've written the first book. I've written the second book now. And now I'm writing the third book. I'm almost done with the third book. The guy eventually gets a job someplace else. He puts in a deal. And then the infuriating thing happens. Like nobody's interested, right? Like nobody's interested. And then one person is interested. And now everybody's interested. <laughs> it like almost just makes you shake your fist. It's like, I'm the same guy I was yesterday. Why weren't you interested in me then? And so we got a preemptive bid. So so one of the guys didn't want to go to auction with this thing. So he put in a preemptive bid. And this is why you have an agent. Because at this point, you know, it had been five years and I would have given away my book for free. It would have just been like, put it on the shelf. I don't care if you ever give me any royalties. Just put it out there. I'll be a real author and I can die happy. And so he puts in a preemptive bid for $60,000. 
for, for three books. And my agent tells him, no. My agent doesn't even call me. He just tells him, yeah. no. Flat, He's flat just out. like, no, this guy's worked five years for this. Come on. <laughs> so so the guy calls back, you know, a half an hour later and offers $75,000, which, you know, for a first book series is quite good. The average uh, per book at that time was $7,500 for, for a first book. So $25,000 per book. Good. Not earth shaking numbers, but very good. And, and of course, we took it. And I've been with Orbit ever since then. So that was why you have an agent is they keep their brains when you cannot keep yours. So huh. I don't even almost know where to take that. Um, <laughs> I was trying to calculate in my head real quick. Like, oh, so that was five years. So that's what, like 260 weeks times 40 hours per week is like 10,000 <laughs> hours or something. I was trying to figure out 15% goes to the agent. You did a lot of work for $6 an hour. Didn't yeah, you? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, then, I mean, it's really six years because then you do another year of, of work editing the books. That's actually what I'd like to ask you because yeah. you know, I love how music is made mm. and how books are written. Because you know, like I love the Beatles and uh, the Beach Boys, and there's just a lot of documentary footage about you know George Martin working with them and whatnot. But but if you listen to a demo for a song, like if you listen to the artist demo, which is just a few chords, maybe a riff, and then you listen to the actual them work on it, and then you can have the pre-recorded demo, and then they'll do five different versions of it, ten different versions of it, and then they'll pick something. You talked about taste earlier. This gap that Ira Glass talks about mm-hmm. is huge for us creatives because I do know what good is, and right. I know. I'm shit. <laughs> and so often I think people look at, you know, they'll flip through your book and they'll read it and they'll go like, wow. Like they assume, I assumed, we assume that professionals put put this out. Like, like this comes from your head. Right. And and it's just like, here's I just put out a first draft of something, right? Like, and it and it just gets sold. You right. put six years into it. How many times, like by the time I read what is what is published, how many times would you have rewritten? Um, so I, like obviously rewriting can mean a lot of different things, right? So there's levels to it. Uh, if you go to some random page in the middle of the book, like I've certainly looked at that sentence 50 times. I mean, and then I've, I've probably reworked it at least like just a random sentence, probably 10 to 15 times. Like I kind of know I'm done when I, when I'm going over pages and I'm changing like an adjective back to the way it was like the previous draft, like a draft ago, like, Oh, now you're just kind of fooling around at that point. And then you're like, okay, I'm getting to the place where I could spend like, like the book is never done. It's never perfect. It's like, you get to a place where you go, I could spend six more months on this and I can make it 10% better. Okay. Maybe for me, that's worth it. And then you go, I could spend six more months on it and I make it 3% better. You're like, okay, well that's six months out of my life. That's half of a first draft of something else. So that costs me too much of another book that I'm going to do. So for me, I go, okay, now I'm getting diminishing returns. But so if you look at other places, if you look at uh, the final page, or you look at the first page, like I didn't get the first scene of the first book, right? Until after I'd finished the whole trilogy. Like I, I rewrote that first scene at least 100 times, at <laughs> least, <laughs> like I, I got it done. I it was okay enough. I moved on to the second book. It still was bothering me. It's like, okay, your first scene has to do so much. Like, like we talked about the first minute, like everybody's got to be in, like you've got to introduce things. It's got to be different enough, but not too different. If it's too different, you don't give them any hooks to hold on to. They're like, what world am I in? It's like, so each detail has to be telling each, the characters have to be in immediate peril or they've got to be in something interesting, but it's got to be a characteristic peril. It's got to be like, this is a snapshot of their normal life, but it's an interesting normal life. And we're going to see them do something different soon, but first we have to establish normal. And so getting the kid and he's, he's got to get coins for tomorrow because dues are due tomorrow. And so he's going to go under the slats into this dark, creepy, crawly place to look for some money and it's wet and it's damp. And like, I worked on that at least a hundred times. It was just like over and over and over. So the parts that really matter, you realize like there's parts where it matters less. You know, you're 400 pages in, you, you've just taken a scene, you've hopped from one character to another. Okay, so this is a minor character. Eh, the readers kind of really want to get back to you're establishing something. It's important. But like, if this scene isn't perfect, if this page isn't perfect, that's kind of okay because the readers are pushing. They, they're, they've got this narrative momentum. Like that page, you probably don't need to go over 100 times. 
it just doesn't matter quite as much if it's not perfect. Now you still want to have it be up to your own standard. Um, but you focus your attention on like, okay, so I just worked on a, a key scene in Nemesis where I, I just pull the rug out and it's like, this has to work just right. So it's like, I go over it and over and over it. And I've done crazy things with, uh, with the publishing process. So, so when I wrote Black Prism, so that was my, so I did the first trilogy, the Night Angel trilogy, and it was selling well. My publisher came back to me and they're like, Hey, we just want your next three books. You know, can be whatever you want. And I, I knew I wanted to write more Night Angel, but I was like, the next thing I want to write in this book, I don't think I have the, the skills for it yet. So, so, so this is something I think is really important for a creative to know. Understand where your own gifts are. Be humble enough to know what you can and can't pull off. And like, as I go along, I'm always trying to pull off harder things. I'm always like, okay, can I take a character that you dislike and and make you start rooting for them. So I have a character, a side character in the Night Angel trilogy who kills one of your favorite characters, okay? Kills this really good guy. And you're just like, you terrible person. I'll just keep it, you, you know, <laughs> you, <laughs> you horrible woman. And then it's like, can I make you root for this character? It's like, I think I can. And so, so I take on a challenge like that. And then the next book, I'm like, okay, we've got this guy who's been a good guy. Um, You've seen him. He's he's struggled to do the right thing. Can I have him descend into evil in such a way that every step of it seems rational until at some point you tear away from that character and you go, this dude's becoming a monster. And then when you look back as a reader, you go, wait, did I justify it when that dude raped some kids? Like, I was okay with that because he was my friend. Like, what? How do I feel about that as a reader? How do I feel about me when it's like, oh, it, my buddy would never do that. So I take on these different challenges. But but as as a writer, uh, to bring a full circle, like I knew I wasn't ready for what I wanted to do just now. So what I did in Nemesis, I knew I wasn't ready to do that. So I wrote a different book. And that book has a key scene where you think you're reading about one character and then you found, find out that there's this sort of man in the iron mask kind of thing in a place where you don't expect it in a book. Um, and I didn't have it quite right. And and the book was about to go to press. We, we'd gone through all the places where they tell you and, and they send you this thing. They're like, this is this is they call it first pass. But it's like it's like sort of the printed version. It's the galleys, the printed version of your novels. They're like, you have a budget. You, you know, each thing that you do costs us eight dollars. So, you know, if you cost us more than a thousand dollars, we're charging you. We will take this out of your paycheck. <laughs> You know, they really don't want to, to make I like how you're like, I'm going to get out my checkbook because I got to fix this. So, Here yeah, we go. <laughs> I, I literally sent a thing and, and I'm like, I, this this scene has been killing me. Debbie was was my editor. And and I said, I, I don't have it right. I got it. I finally got it. I, I'm like, I know they're going to hate me. I know they're going to charge me. Let them charge me. It's not right. It's got to be right. And I said, fine, you know, whatever. Let them charge me. And I sent it off to her and she handled it. So she... I'm sure the production people hated me and they should. They absolutely should hate me because where art and business come together, it's hell for the business people. It's no joy for the art people either. But like it's it's tough for the business people cuz artists suck to work with, man. <laughs> I have noticed that as a visionary entrepreneur and creative myself, like I'll finally say like I've realized that I am not an operations guy. I'm not an integrator to use the terms of Gino Wickman and attraction and rocket fuel and stuff. But hmm. I like big ideas. I love starting. I love saying like, guys, imagine if we can do this thing. And, and everyone's like, yeah, how do we do that? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, is that, is that my job to figure out how to do that? Or is like, is my job just to say like, this is what we should really do, guys. And so I think, honestly, I think everybody's hard to work with. I think anyone who is passionate and really cares is hard to work with. I used to owning a creative agency. I used to be bothered by internal friction. You know, like the, the friction between our salespeople or our accounts people or the creative people. Like the, the friction between operations and should we do another draft? And is it worth giving it to the client for free for better work? Right. And there was always this friction and it bothered me until I finally realized like, hey, anything good comes with friction. Like it's just part of the process. And if right. we're all mature and we're all respectful, then it is what it is. So <laughs> I have to imagine that that your team in the end was like, hey, this is actually much better. So yeah. let's just give it to Brent. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sure I'm sure she read it and went, he's right. You know, if she'd read it and thought I was wrong, she would have been like, this is going to cost us, you know, $5,000 and it's going to screw some things up. She was very willing to say no. But but when I was right, I was right. And so yeah. she's like, uh, 
Yeah, that's going to help. And this is a this is the key scene of this book. If this doesn't work, the book doesn't work. So it's worth it to get it right. So she was like, yeah, the other way worked, but this works so much better. So yeah. she just she handled it and all praise to her because she <laughs> caught all the fire for doing that. And she didn't even come back to me. She didn't even she just took it. She handled it. She well, she well, worked with that nexus between the art and the business. And that was brilliant. So that's what's so important about having a good team as well. Like, you know, in Will Smith's I don't know if I'm allowed to say his name out loud, guys. Yeah, oh, you can. Um, ooh, everybody's already Smith's... left. I drove all... Everybody's <laughs> gone, man. So you got total freedom. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You drove everyone away That's with right, that realism. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so just between you and I, right. so Will Smith's biography, I picked it up before he decided to punch uh, you know, someone in the face. Yeah, yeah. And, and then when he did, I was just... Like, honestly, I, I was so turned off. Like, I was just... It was so out of character. And I yeah. so... It did not enjoy the moment. I was like, I'm not going to give Will Smith the satisfaction of reading his book. And then about six months later, I did. And I realized, oh, it gives insight to why he reacted the way he did and what he did, which is cool. But he talks about, you know, just the importance of surrounding yourself with a really amazing team. And truthfully, you're only as bold and only as strong and can only move as fast as the weakest people on your team. So I think for any kind of creative, anyone who's going to be dedicated to a craft, you just, you just have to, surround yourself with those people who are willing to fight right. for you. And it seems like you've done that. Yeah. I really, really have some some beautiful key pieces in 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 place, which is lovely. Cause so what's most important for for an author, you know, like maybe you're at a level where you're humming along, but maybe in between you <laughs> being a writer writing everything with no agent. And what would be the first version? What would be the first few steps for someone who wants to become a professional author? Who should you surround yourself with? <clears throat> Oh man, so so uh, so so much of of being a writer is emotion management. So figuring out what what fills your tank because it's like writing is an incredibly solitary endeavor, and like being a successful writer is a weird, different thing. Like what I'm doing now requires a whole different skill set than what it takes to write a book. And the first thing you have to do is you have to write a book. And so it's like, okay, the first thing is not to work on your sales and presentation skills. You know, your speech making skills, those might be really helpful someday. But first, you have to read a book that makes people want to invite you to give speeches. So the first thing is is figuring out, do I love writing? What about it do I love? How do I get to a finished novel because you have to finish. And that's like, that's where most people fall down. Lots of people that there's some ridiculous number of people, like, like 80 or 90% of people want to write a novel. It's just like, okay, well, I want to be in the NBA, but like I can, I can dribble. And see, it's funny. Cause, cause in my head, I know, like, I am very confident that one day I'm going to write a book. And yet like even if I'm writing an Instagram post, yeah. I use it as practice. Yeah, okay. to say, can I write this as like an opening chapter for a book? And how would oh, I nice. do it? And like, I'm in my head. I've been practicing for years. Sure. Not only am I nowhere close to finishing. I mean, I'm nowhere close to even starting. I don't even, <laughs> right, I don't even right. have any idea of like when I'm going to do this. But I'm so sure yeah. that one day I'm going to write a book. Right. Right. <laughs> well, it's like we we all know the power of story. I feel like we all consume media that tells story all the time. And so we have this very, all of us have a visceral connection to storytelling and we do it in different ways. I mean, you do it in a podcast. You you say, here's who you are. Here's who you can be. Here's who you can learn from. We'll be part of your story. We'll be part of you building. You can build a better you. That's the story, right? And you can build a better you by learning from people who've been there before. We're going to help you in that process. Like that's part of a story. It's like, I'm going to come along and shore you up. That's a fantastic story because people do need to be shored up. So figuring out what do you need to support you emotionally to get done with a story. And for some people, that might just be like literally your mom saying, this is brilliant. Or or it might be a writer's group that says, this is great. For other people, the writer's group is soul destroying and they can't do it. You know, it's just like I go in there and Tina's so much better than I am or they all write Westerns and I can't stand Westerns. I can't be with these people. So so figuring out what kind of writer you are, it's like, unfortunately, there's no one shape. Like there's people who write by the seat of their pants. You know, Stephen King, he writes by the seat of his pants. Is he really writing by the seat of his pants or has he just internalized the structures of story so well that he doesn't need to write down an outline? It's like, he knows how story works. If he's 
you know, 20 percent of the way into the story and he hasn't introduced the main conflict. Part of him is itching, saying, I better introduce the main conflict. It feels like it's been a while. You know, somebody else is like, oh, I'm I want the book to be, you know, 100,000 words. I'm at 20,000 words. I haven't introduced main conflict. I need to fix that now, you know, because they've read all the books that lay it out analytically. So some people are more analytical. So some people are more um, intuitive. And either way, like your brain can work to tell stories. So I think that emotion management of figuring out what charges you up, you know, is is it watching some YouTube videos that are like, dude, that idiot Brent Weeks was able to make this happen. If he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is like, man, I've read his books and they're not that good. And he <laughs> sold like millions of copies. Dang, I can make it like if that's what it takes to fill you, that's OK. And whatever it takes to, is like, like I say, put words on the page every day. And if it's too terrifying, like I break it, I still do this because I will get overwhelmed. And so if it's too terrifying to think I got to write 2000 words a day, you know, well, Stephen King writes 2000 words a day. You do that. You have a novel in four months. It's like, oh, I, I can't do that. It's like, OK, write one sentence. Can you write a single sentence? Because actually, before you write one sentence, you have to decide like 50 things, especially if it's like, OK, who's speaking? Whose head are we in? Where are they saying this? Is this the most interesting place for them to have this scene? Does this scene feel different if it's late at night and I'm lost, bad neighborhood in Chicago, than it does if I'm sitting in the rich guy's library and we're having drinks? It's like like the same scene can feel really different, but I got to decide which one's the most interesting place for them to have this. Can I, can I ask you, yeah. in this moment, are you intuitively working through what excites you with possibilities or are you making these kind of analytical decisions sentence by sentence word by word scene by scene kind of act by act so this is kind of what i love about the kind of fantasy i write is epic fantasy secondary world fantasy it's like it requires so much it's like you've got to build an entire world it's like what you need to have as a writer to do this really well is is you need to bring together both so for me I start as an intuitive, but I've got my analytical side. So so there have been times, like with that chapter, I was just like, it bothers me still. <laughs> and I look at it analytically, and it checks all the boxes, right? Like, like it does all the things it's supposed to do. My editor, an, an analytical person, looks at it and says, it's accomplishing what it needs to accomplish. It's fine. But there's something in me that goes... Mm, no, it's not it's right. Not. So, so, so I'll trust myself. So now if I get stuck... I go, there's something in me that's unhappy about probably what I've already done. So like, crap, now I got to figure that out. And then I just start asking myself questions. So frequently I'm writing intuitively. It's like, okay, well, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll just have these two characters. Like if I'm stuck, I'll be like, I'll just have these two characters talking halfway into the scene. Here's, I'll, I'll just work on the dialogue. I don't know where they are yet. I don't know exactly what's happened, but I have one line that's hilarious. And this is, this will work really great. And it's like, okay, well, well I, I need to set the scene. So that, so this, this line pays off, right? Like, okay, you gotta, you, you got the punchline. You gotta, so, so you find, I, it, it's funny because when I'm helping people with strategy or creative or branding or, or any kind of campaign, I'm always like, I need to figure out like the thread. Like I need to figure out um, like the, the way that I'm going to connect everything that we get really excited about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And whatever is it is that we get excited about, we can build everything else around right. that. And if it's a visual cue, if it's a tone, if it's um, a one-liner, if it's a right. joke, like I don't really care what it is. I yeah. just need that. We just need to find that thing. And yet I don't know what it is. Right. But I know when I found it, is that like... So you're writing intuitively until your intuition stops working. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. I, I I mean, I'll go back and I'll be like, okay, I've got these two characters. They're they're speaking. Their lines are great. They're the they, they work. Really <laughs> if I do well. say so myself, this but, is the greatest well, dialogue I, ever written. Well, I, well I, I mean, this is part of it, right? Like like knowing when you've done good work. Do you laugh it out loud at your own characters' jokes? Oh man, I I smirk. I don't know that I've ever laughed out loud because there's that element of surprise that has to work for real humor where, when you told it. Like, but I'll go back and I'll read something. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, that worked. You're not disassociating yourself from the characters enough that something's coming out and you're surprising yourself. You're like, this character just said this thing. That's hilarious. <laughs> no, no. The main level of surprise I'll get is I'll go back and I'll read something that I wrote years ago and, and i'll be like yeah i was a young writer when i did that it's it's probably pretty crappy i've learned so much since then and i'll write it and i'll read it i'll be like 
that's actually pretty good. I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> like, like that worked better than I thought, you know? Like, okay, that's oh, all right. I, I love that. I love that when you're like, Did I write this? This is this is good stuff. Huh? Hey, that kid, I, that kid's got something there. He might have a yeah. future. <laughs> so yeah. But the analytical part will be like, I'll start interrogating that scene. I'll be like, okay, these two characters are talking. This works. Like, but this is heads in a void. You know, like the reader, this is like two characters talking in a cloud bank. It's like, okay, then I'll ask those questions. Like, where is the most interesting place these characters could have this conversation? Okay, they could have it in, in imminent peril. Okay, that that's fine. But like, what will start to connect this to the theme of the story? Or, or if the characters are um, are maneuvering with each other, and this is a political thing, and they're, they're sitting down over a meal, like what could that, what, what, where could that be? Okay, it's at the guy's mansion and he's building a new mansion. Like he's building it in the worst uh, area of town. Why? Because he's claiming it for himself. He's saying, I will come in and take your crappy neighborhood, but also your crappy town and your crappy little kingdom and it will be mine. And so he's he's establishing this thing. And then he's going to, you know, he's going to sort of torture some people while doing that with their own decisions. And then, you know, he's going to at the very end, he's going to reveal like, how do you like the, the 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 braised peasant that you just had? And she's like, braised pheasant? Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the scene kind of ends there. He, you know, he, he just fed her. He just fed her human being. And so this is this is a note I, I have that, I mean, we're talking about the work, but I, I wrote down, your characters and world are so extreme. The environments are so extreme. The topics are so extreme in terms of child slavery, in terms of sexual trafficking and abuse and mm. poverty and theft and corruption. And it's just so extreme that it's like, I mean, as, as a safe outsider, it's like, what is going on in this world? But And yet you're able to have these very principled people, mm -hmm. these very real human people who are doing terrible things. You mentioned that <laughs> earlier. You're like, hmm, how can we have people betray the very things that make them up? Is that a mark of just good writing is that your your style you've been able to establish or is there something else to this because your work is very dark and very extreme and there are terrible worlds with characters we should not like and yet even when they're doing bad things we, we kind of like some of them right right well i want to do a lot of things obviously i i had six years to work on it <laughs> Um, so this is all all of your the, the worlds you create, no? True. Yeah. I wanted to have there. There's always a thread of hope in these worlds. There's always a little bit of there's some goodness in some of the characters. And I started the book with I'd written in college after I took that class. I started on a novel set in this world. And I spent five years on that novel. And then I realized this is kind of fundamentally flawed. I, I messed up some some of the fundamentals of this. That, so no matter how long I work on this, it's going to be messed up. And I said, you know what? I have some things in this world that are really good. I, there's things that I didn't mess up in the world building. So I rewound the clock 20 years. And I took the most interesting character who kind of shown up in the side of that world. And then I was like, okay, now I've got 20 years of, of world history built up. Now I can have like prophecies and fun stuff that people like in fantasy. And I'll actually know that it's going to happen because I already wrote it. You know, you're never going to see that. But like, oh, I've already made all those decisions. I know who those characters are and, and who they're going to be 20 years from now. You know, the ones who live. So I, I had this one character show up who was really fascinating to me and I didn't know his story. And I'm like, how does this weird, total badass, but with some kind of moral code, like, where does he come from? And so I had this question of myself. I said, how could a basically rational, a basically moral human being become a total badass assassin? Because that's not a job a basically moral human being would pick, right? Who like, chews on garlic, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Well, well that's that's the master. So, 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 ah, so, okay. So, so I'm I just said, like, I, such weird, such weird quirks, and yet I love them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. So this character, he has to be in a situation that's utterly dire, where like all of the safeguards, the things that we don't let children do, have broken down. So for a moral kid to want to become an assassin, he's got to have no other way out 
Like, this is the only way he sees safety. So I was like, okay, so that gives us our setting. We're in this horrible city, this utterly corrupt, and he's raised in a gang. He's raised in a, in a gang of children. And, and I said, I, I know that this is going to be a story about, like, assassins and people working in prostitution and stuff. And, I, and so I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to establish that really early on. So you're going to see, like, actually probably the most brutal scene of the whole trilogy is in the first 50 pages. Like, you have abuse of children. And that, that was kind of my way of saying, like, this book is probably not for you. Like, get out now before you've attached. Did people in your life and who knew you start reading through this and go, "This, hold on, this came out of your mind? Yeah. <laughs> did, they, did they look at you like, are you, Brent, are you, are you okay, man? <laughs> My wife still <laughs> like, like, honey, honey. But, but it was like, I really wanted to actually, like, it's, it's an action-y fantasy novel with assassins and, and magic and this and that. But like, I wanted to ask questions about the nature of evil. So my, my wife was literally working uh, in the mental health field. She, she got her master's and she was working with sexually reactive kids. So this is young children who have been abused sexually and are now acting out sexually, often abusing other kids. Well, so so you got kids who are victims who are who are very, very young. I mean, it's the kind of work like you, you never walk away. Like, I'm not even going to tell you some of the stories because like, like it's that awful. And and, and I was like, but that's evil. <laughs> like, where, like, where, like the amount of damage you see that it does to a person for their whole life. It's like, like, I don't know that you can call it anything but evil. But where do people interact with that? When does it become evil? If you're seven years old, if you're six years old, and you're abusing your little sister or your little brother. It's like, are you evil? Like, these are really uncomfortable questions. And I like had these really uncomfortable questions about human nature and, and how people do evil things. And I was like, I want to wrestle with that. I want to wrestle with it in an open way. And the way to do that is to have characters who are in an utterly broken system who have made bad choices or who do make bad choices right in front of you. And you're like, don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, we did it. But then it's also like like fiction can be really cheap where you see people make bad choices. You see people live minus the most recent James Bond. Like, you see James get away with it. He kind of lives this horrible lifestyle and he pays no price. And I was like, I don't want to have fiction where people pay no price. It's like this guy is the badass, but he pays the price for it. And when he does bad things. He pays for it. He doesn't get away with it. Like it catches up with him. It's got a moral cost. So I was like, I want to tell this story that on a first read is just, it's fun and it's cool. And it's, but when, when you really think about it, it's, it's deeper and you're like, man, these people are wrestling with really hard stuff. And, and so that's why I wanted it to be dark because I feel like, like the light of hope burns brighter when it's chosen over like, I can despair and live in darkness. Other people do. I can give up. I can be this. Or these people could keep fighting despite being in situations just as bad as I am. And actually, eventually they make it. They might have a lot of scars when they get through because they've made some bad decisions and they do have to pay for it. But like they can make it. And so I, I think that really has resonated with people because it's honest. It's just like, this is tough. It's a tough world. It beats us up. And sometimes we make bad choices and we hurt people we love. But you know what? There's healing and, and we can do right things, even after we've done wrong things. So, you know, what's so amazing about hearing you, you speak about this? Um, I mean, obviously, this is your profession. This is your craft. But I think I confuse plot with writing or storyline or characters or even the world that you create. And yet there's so much um, human emotion that goes into your work. It's as you're describing this, I'm just thinking of shows like Breaking Bad, mm -hmm. which, you know, Vince Gilligan was able to take this character and then slowly over the course of five years, just chip away at each moral decision and then sprinkle a little bit of ego in there mm -hmm. to show, mm -hmm. hey, we can watch someone completely slide away and turn into a terrible person slowly over time. Mm -hmm. And up until a point, I think up until like the fourth season, root for him even. Um, or maybe less to a lesser degree because it's a little bit more pop in my mind, but Dexter, you know, this idea of this anti-hero who, who is in, you know, built differently, abused, terrible situation, and yet has been able to slightly turn it for good. Sure. I guess what I'm most struck with is what you're describing the questions, the challenges, the everlasting, I guess, uh, human side of the characters you've developed is so much more than just plot or characters or world. Right. 
that's the secret sauce. I, I guess <laughs> the secret different. sauce is be really good at this. <laughs> well, well, like there's another way to answer your question, which, which is like, okay, you, you have these really extreme worlds and stuff. I think Francis Scott Key or somebody, he, he wrote a letter to a young artist and he was sort of like, look, like in the hands of an incredibly skilled writer, two people sitting in a drawing room and having a conversation can be a scintillating read. He's like, but you're a young writer. You do not have those gifts yet. So take on big stuff because if you're honest and you're passionate, like this, this is what I thought with, with my first book. I'm like, I will not be the most polished writer at age 25. I just won't writing. It requires 50 different skills and I don't have all of them yet or, or I have them, but they're not great. It's like, I'm going to make some mistakes. You're going to see some nail holes in the wall when I, when I put this sucker up. But what I can do is I can be, I can be honest. I can be passionate. I can tell the truth fearlessly. And I can hope that people respond to that and forgive me for my shortcomings as an author because of what I built and the passion I put into it. And so that I was just like, I hope this sort of muscular, passionate writing carries through all my obvious flaws. And you're like, you didn't need that adjective in that sense. You kind of went for an obvious thing here. You could have done this more artfully. And, and it's like, okay, people got carried through because I think they reacted. I think they react to the human side of it. It's like, this yeah. guy's trying to tell the truth. He's not trying to impress people. Yeah, And he's not being a phony here. Like these huh. characters are really wrestling with something that's hard for them. Yeah. You know, it's, you reminded me of um, in high school in English, we had we read uh, Hills Like White Elephants uh, by Hemingway. I'm not sure if you're familiar with oh, that. Oh, I haven't read story. that one, I don't think. Yeah. And it's it's about two people sitting at a train station uh, talking. Yeah. And then they, like, they get on a train. <laughs> yeah. And I remember reading this and I was just like, nothing happens. Right. And, and my teacher was like, are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure nothing happens? And I'm like, it's just two people talking, right? And like, are you sure? And my understanding is it's actually about a couple discussing abortion okay. and that they're in an awkward situation. And there's all these hidden contexts and things between the lines and things you're supposed to read. And as soon as you might place these characters in not such a benign world, but you start to have that context, you go, oh, this is like a really serious or heavy conversation. Right. Um, and that's what I love about writing. Now, you talked about uh, Tolkien being inspired by Tolkien and yep. writers of the past. I think the first fantasy I ever came across, I pulled this book just to prepare for it, but this is a really old series from the 60s. Oh, yeah. But uh, the, you know, the Book of Three by Lloyd Alexander and then the Black Cauldron and what have you. I remember my grade six teacher reading this to our class and me going like, this is a story. This is a book. Like This, this is a thing. It's about young characters. And um, that got me first into reading. And I think that there's a lot of things about fantasy, especially when it blew up in the 80s and the 90s. But with where writing is going, with where media is going, with um, where fantasy is going, like do things like AI worry you, bother you? Uh, the ever you know democratizing world where everything's becoming more and more and more niche. Like, where is this whole industry going, in your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> um. <clears throat> So, so I, I mean, I played with the the AI stuff a little bit. It's, it's. Did you go write a great fantasy book? Yeah, I didn't try that one. I, I, I said, okay, what, what are five ways to get through a locked door? You know, and, oh. then, and then it came. Oh, so up you're using ways. it like as prompts? Yeah, sure, sure. So my thought is that in the short term, because it's really hard to to cast out how far will these things go and how well will they work. I mean, they're scraping the internet, like everything's on the internet. It's like I'm not really sure at how well the AI is picking up like the architecture of a story because stories do have an architecture and you can have people who like analytically will lay out, okay, this is the formula. And like, we've all gone to enough Hollywood movies. Like we kind of know what the formula is, at least intuitively for a Hollywood movie. And every once in a while, somebody will throw that out and, and you get like a Quentin Tarantino doing something completely, you know, a Pulp Fiction or you'll get Memento or something where you're like, yeah, and, I, and I don't even like it. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> When right, I went to film well, school, right. it blew my mind that they're like, okay, it's a three act structure. Uh, yeah. Within the first twenty pages, of the first twenty minutes, something yeah. has to happen to, to change the world, drive the character forward. And right. the middle act, this happens, and then the third act, the, the climax is actually twenty pages before the end of the movie. And I'm like, right. it changed the way I watched movies. But right. also, I realized I don't like anything that doesn't follow that structure. Like, don't <laughs> give me a Matrix two seven act weird structure or something. Like, I don't like any of that. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Oh, yeah, the Matrix two, yeah. That's a different rabbit trail. Uh, 
<laughs> um, so I, I'm not really sure how well it can um, uh, internalize kind of the plot beats. And it might be able to eventually do it pretty darn well and write you a lifeless script. You know, like, and we've seen scripts that are very lifeless that get somehow made into movies that are just like, you're like, I want my time back. I mean, anymore now, I can, I can tell very quickly. It's, oh, it's going to be one of those. And I'm just out of there. But every once in a while, you're like, I really like this actor. Maybe they'll do something with it. And they're like, no, no, they, they just couldn't overcome the writing uh, or the directing. Um, so like what I think it'll do in the short term is I think it will utterly flood all the wannabe writers who are at the bottom of your Kindle lists, who, you know, were writing a novel and then they'd sell 50 copies. And then every once in a while, they might sell 80 copies and they'd hope to do better. And every once in a while, one of those might have, you know, on their fifth or 10th novel, they might have broken out and they they might have done a lot better. And I think people are just going to, AI is going to flood those. People are going to think, oh, there's easy money. You just do 20 of these. Everybody buys, they sell one copy. You know, all you're doing is pressing the button and then you submit it with another script. And so now there's, instead of there being a million of those every year. Now there's 500 million of those every year at the bottom of the Kindle store. And so anybody who's just a dude trying to write and who doesn't know anybody and doesn't know anything and puts his thing in, he's done. He's he's washed out. The tide just takes him. So I think there's going to be a tide of garbage. And and I just did see a thing. So on the very short term, I found out I'm right with this. The, the number of submissions to like Clark's World, which is one of the industry magazines of short stories, <laughs> has just gone like that. It's like, why did we suddenly get, you know, 5,000% more submissions this year? Yeah, they've, they've closed it off, I think, didn't they? I think they have. And I think and you and I both like, saw the same daily email. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yep, that's what happened. It's like, so all the slush pile things just get really, really hard. So in the short term, the bottom just gets flooded. And that's terrible uh, for, for the people who are honestly working and trying to put out something good. Uh, I mean, that already had a lot of slush in there. It wasn't people trying to do things good. It was people trying to churn things out. But... um what I think it'll be in the medium term, I think writers will will use it as as prompts. I think they'll they'll be like, I'm stuck on a thing. Okay, let's let's see what this would be. Uh, I, I think I saw somebody who was like, oh, I'll use this to say, um, write me a 20 minute speech on this. And then it lays out a 20 minute speech. And it's like, okay, the stuff it uses is mostly garbage, but it gets the structure right. And you're like, okay, it's a 20 minute speech is that many thousand words at a normal speaking rate. Okay. Well, now I know how long it is now. Oh, here's the finale. I mean, it's finale is garbage, but like that's where the finale has to start. Here's its citations. It uses the wrong citations, but I have my own citations. Oh, it starts with an anecdote. Okay. I can come up with my own anecdote that, that puts on that thing. And so now that writer who still has to do all the work of putting in the good examples and, and finding the right thing for the structure, like, maybe he's really bad at structure and maybe he's a brilliant dude or she's a brilliant woman and she, she knows all the stuff cold, but she, she hasn't given that many speeches. She doesn't know how to give a speech. And now you fill that in. She puts in the things she puts it out there. It has saved her 20 hours, you know? So, so, so I think in the short to middle term, writers will learn and speakers and uh, other people who work, you know, executives, people will learn to use it to prop up their writing and it will help them. So I, I can see using the, uh, the art AI for the same sort of thing, even though I like for me to do character sketches, like, well, actually I'm not going to hire an artist to do character sketches for me just because the back and forth is too much. It just take, it drains me to, to do all that and tell an artist, no, I don't like that. I don't like how you did it. Do something different. I don't know what, but, but do that thing yeah, like that back and forth. Creative direction and art direction is its own like crazy yeah, skill. Right. That exhausts me. And I don't want to do it 10 times. I don't want to tell an artist 10 times that their work isn't any good at what it isn't what I was imagining. So like, I won't, I'll do it four times and then I'll stop and I'll get something I'm not very happy with. Well, instead, if, if I spend some time learning the tools, I, I can go there and have somebody do a drawing for me. That's never going to appear commercially, but I can be like, okay, I need somebody. I'm going to forget how tall this person is in relation to my my 200 other characters like but if i did if i if i figured out the tools i could get nice sketches of every single character in my books i could have them saved in a file i can look at them and be like oh yeah yeah oh i forgot that that dude's asian you know like like he, uh, he, he's asian he's you, you without know. having to go back to your bible that that exists somewhere right which because i'm an intuitive person like i don't keep that right Right, right, right. <laughs> and so sometimes I remember everything and sometimes you, I don't. You know, I mean, if you had one, like I, I was telling you earlier about David Eddings being one of my favorite kind of authors. Yeah. They, they very quietly put out this, this like thing that I picked up that was literally his like writing Bible for like oh. the history of every 
like the history and the coins and the and and how how this secular world works and okay. what they focus on and who the gods are and everything. And I was like, this is gonna be so cool. And then I was like, this is really boring. But <laughs> <laughs> but I feel good having it as a fan. <laughs> I think I've read it once and I had right. to like it's like reading a textbook. But here's it, here's a tip, man. Just go ahead and put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, we can sell enough to, to the super fan. So, so mainly, I think writers will find ways that are really clever to help prop up the work that they already do. Like, okay, I'm bad at this kind of structure. So this will do that for me. I'll fill in all the things. Okay, I can do that. So so that's where I see it in the in the medium term. You, you know, the long term, I, I don't have any special insight into the future. I don't understand well enough yet how it abstracts principles from just the absolute you know, oceans of data that's out there. It's like, does it abstract like how art works? Or is it just, you know, like, okay, here's how lighting works. Okay, it seems to be abstracting how lighting works in art. But like art, like, like uh, visual art, it's like, okay, well, that's a 2D thing. Pixels work a certain way. Maybe it's abstracting how weight works. You know, obviously it hasn't got fingers yet, but, but eventually it'll figure out how many fingers we like to have on our hands. So I don't understand like the deep architecture of it well enough to have any real guesses. It's like, I think we, we anthropomorphize everything in our lives. Like we talk to our car as if it's making choices. We get mad at the rock that we stumble over because it obviously <laughs> tripped us. It's like, we do that with AI all the time. It's like, oh, it's alive. It's breathing. It's like, it's not alive. It's just spinning it's just back information. currently a prediction machine. But right. I, th I think the idea of using it for writing prompts or visual prompts or idea prompts or, or even as, as a template for something, I think that's genius. And so often, um, you know, if you can just, if you can just make a, a really small part of your process more efficient, either you're going to save time as, as a creative, yeah. or you can rededicate that time to the stuff that you really have to, like right. maybe asking yourself some of those really big questions that you've been posing. Yeah. So, so I, I hope it'll be that. I think it'll be another tool in the quiver for the people who want to use it. Amazing. I'm like going way over, but I'm cool with this. Are you, are, do you have a hard out? I want to... I'm okay. I'm okay, actually. So, <laughs> so I, I mean, so my next thing is like... Next, I, wanna, I still want to get to Nemesis. I've, if, I've, if you can, let me, let me just transition. I've signed this many of these. Uh, this is my last 200. I'm, I, so, so these are tip-ins. They go into the front of people's books and I yeah. sign that. So I've been signing 4,000 of those. And it's the, uh, it's the opposite of my job. Usually my job is... it's all mental and this is all physical it's like all you do and it's repetitive so it's the opposite of my job i, I usually hate it but but now i put on an audiobook and i i sign with fountain pens i have beautiful fountain pens so so i'm making it through but i have i'm down to my last 200 so that's the next thing i'm doing after i'm done talking with you we'll have you get to it in a second but um, i do want to talk about your your new book night angel nemesis it comes out uh, april 25th 2013 so 2013 <laughs> it comes out april 25th <laughs> Uh, 2023. So if you're listening to this or watching this after mm -hmm. that, it's available. If not, you can pre-order it. So I do want to ask, Night Angel Nemesis comes back to this world of, of your first series. Uh, why revisit it this many years later? And if, if I can really be honest, like, is it just because you're like, I love the characters and I can make some money? <laughs> Um, no, no, I, uh, it's, it's not. I'm in this stupid position where I've never, I've never worried about the money part of things. Like, like my dream was always if I could eke out a living and like the ultimate dream was, was like, if when we have kids, my wife could take some months off from work, however long she wants to, before she has to go back to work. So what does a professional like, I don't even know. Like, you have two kids. Is your wife able to stay home? I mean, are you like, are you guys doing yeah, really, yeah. really so, well? So, like, how uh, does, like, <laughs> how does wealth work as a professional author? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, um, so my wife, she, so she technically works for me. She does, you know, the bookkeeping. I also have a part time assistant who helps me with, you know, all the stuff that I'm bad at. Um, and, and yeah, uh, she, she, otherwise she, she does lots of, um, she does lots of volunteer work and then she's, she's, um, she's a stay home mom. You know, she, she yeah. carries her kids, kids around and, and, you know, helps her parents and, and this and that. So she is, you know, busier than I am, but, but she gets paid for part, part of it. Right. Like, like so, off these, off these books, have you made enough money? Like if you never had to work again, you'd be fine. Or literally it's like, mm, we, we still got to keep releasing some stuff. Um, the discipline of being poor was really helpful. So like I've, <laughs> I put away a lot of money. 
I've always wondered like, okay, is this the one where the, where, where the bottom falls out and I'll, I'll have to, you know, get a real job. And like, at this point in my career, I'm like, I'm not going to have to get a real job. You know, it's, it's going to be okay. I'm I'm going to, I'm going to be able to keep doing this thing. So like, yeah, if, if these, if somehow the sales on this tanked, which would be fascinating, I would really wonder why uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I could make it, I could make it, you know, I'd, I'd land on my feet. So I, but like, so I didn't write this for the money. Actually, actually a lot of it was for me to write the same book over and over like that, that is the way to a ton of money and it's creative death. So, mm. so to me, I want to write a book that scares me. Like, am I going to be able to do this? I don't know. Let's try it. Let's, let's see if I can do this. So for this book, it's like, okay. Like the first thing I, I said, I, I'd always, I had a big story in mind. I have 20 years of the future history of this world in my head. Like I know where the story is going. I'm like, okay, does Kyler have enough for me to tell? Like, cause he's the main character in this. Like, is he interesting enough? Are there places I could go with him that are worth my time? Because I'm going to be spending years with him. And does he have growth that he needs to do? And like, so I spent some time honestly digging into that. And then I said, okay, I'm going back to this world that I made when I was 25. Like I made some creative decisions that I wouldn't make again. So, so, so like early on, like I was influenced by the 80s and 90s, like we all are by the, by the stuff we love. Like I had lots of apostrophes in names. And then by, by the time I was done with this, by the time I was 30, I was like, I'm done with apostrophes <laughs> in names. I, I just don't like it anymore, right? Like it's just not a thing I do. And I'm like, if I go back to Night Angel, I got to put apostrophes back in names, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny because in fantasy, I never say the names out loud. Because I memorize how the words look and I sure. go, oh, it's that character. Right. And my wife takes the time to say each name aloud in her mind. So she's like, okay, yes. you mean this is how you say it? And so when you have a lot of apostrophes, doesn't bother me because yeah. I'm just, I'm like literally using it as a visual, as yeah. a little visual clue of like, oh, it's, it's that it, person. It's that, it's, <laughs> it's that word. Yes. Right. Gotcha. I totally do that. It's, oh man, as I go along, I figure out the different ways that different readers read and what they read for and, and like adjusting for that. And then how different languages work. Oh my gosh. Or how audiobooks work that are different than, um, th th than, than reading on the page. I, like when I first wrote, I was like, I don't care how you pronounce it. Pronounce it however you want. You're the reader. You get to decide. This is a book. This is a story we build together. Uh, you know, and then people are like, no, I want to know how it's really said. And then the narrator, like, I, I didn't realize they'd sold the audiobook, right? So the, the audiobook came out like, like a week after I found out they'd even done an audiobook. And I was like, how's the guy know how to do any of it? And, and he didn't. He didn't even ask me. <laughs> he didn't even ask. And he'd taken, I can say this now, they couldn't have said this before, but um, <laughs> there was one character, the main character, I actually spelled out how you say his name, sort of like, like Hermione. In, in 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 jk rowling right like she's like everybody's calling her hermione and it's hermione for god's <laughs> sake you stupid americans and so she actually has her say it hermione so like, like she spells it out in the book and i sort of did that so i'm like it's kyler i just this is the only one i care about the other ones you can say vi you can say it v you, you know her her full name is veridiana you can you can call her by or v however you want i don't care do it your own way you, you know sister ariel so if you want to call her sister not, ariel not K Kalar, you don't. You're not a fan of right, that, right? Right, right, right. Yes, and so, so he was Kylar, and I was like, Oh, Kylar oh, of 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 the house of whatever. <laughs> it's like it was the only one I cared about. It was the only one I cared about, and he did it the other way. So uh, we we actually got the audiobooks uh, redone by Simon Vance, who's he's Hall of Fame uh, Audible narrator. He's won like 22 or 25 Audis awards. <laughs> golden earphone awards you know he's he's stellar so i get to talk to him and and now people aren't going to realize that this character is actually this this other character for two more books but when you're doing the voice i want you to make sure that it sounds kind of like this and so so i'll tell him secrets like that and he's amazing to work with that's actually one of the most fun things is when you get to be successful is working with other people who are incredibly successful in sort of tangentially related fields because i can see why and how he's so good I can't do it myself, but so I can like give him all these tools. I'll be like, okay, here's what I was doing. Here's what I was trying to do. You figure out how best to do it. And then he takes it and he goes and he makes it his own. And it's like, all of a sudden our creativity becomes additive. And usually can, in writing, can I tell you, it's can I not tell you my additive, secret, it's all me. My secret goal is to only surround myself with the type of people that you're talking about. Right. And, and like last summer, I made the decision because I've spent most of my life priding myself and like 
being the person who's like really sharp and really quick and learns really quick and need to be the smartest person, have all the answers. And last summer I was like, this is holding me back. I have to be an idiot. Like I have to, I have to just proactively decide that I am an idiot because I am. I'm stupid. I'm here to learn. Teach me something. And it was like so freeing for me. But then the next step was like, oh, when you see when, what do they say? Good recognizes good. When, you know, really people with a craft recognize people with a craft. It's like, ooh, how can, how can we just stack the deck? So you surround yourself with these types of people all the time. Um, Unfortunately, it's almost like you have to have done something to, to be invited in. But, yeah, yeah, you know, Groucho Marx said, you know, any club that would let me in, I wouldn't want to be part of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, but it, but it feels like that when you're a budding writer, you're like, or or a budding anything, you're like, yeah, I think I belong in that at that table, but they won't let me in yet. But I know ben I don't belong at this table. Ben Folds has a song called Free Coffee, and one of the lyrics is like, "Hey, when I was broke and struggling as a musician, no one would give me anything, and now that I'm now that I've made it, y'all want to give me free coffee." <laughs> Oh, it's so uh, frustrating. It's it, it, it's like I remember like I I wouldn't buy books in hardcover ever because that was, you know, 25 bucks back then. It was like and now people will just send me free books. Like I just ask and they give me free. It's like I can afford your book now. I don't need it free. I can just buy it. But getting advanced copies to things <laughs> or being sent a book secretly is like one of the greatest little perks of having a show. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I get to meet people. I get to talk to them and all that stuff. All of that is great. You guys see all that. Viewers, listeners, you see all that. What you don't realize is I get sent advanced copies to things and it makes me feel so inside. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what your publisher hopes, right? You know, yeah, I'm right. just going right. like, to be hope. like, I'm going to feel inside, but, but it's a fun little perk, man. <laughs> it, it's, it's a neat little thing. It's a neat little thing. It's, it, it's like a tangible... Uh, it's a tangible benefit of of like all the work you've done to to get there. And people are like, hey, I I I see you there. I see you doing the, the work that you're doing. And so Brent, your your new book, Night Angel Nemesis, it does come out on April 25th, 2023. Again, pre-order it if it's before yeah. that or it's available now. Um, I would recommend, you know, start if you haven't, start with these beautiful 1200 pages. Uh, it's three books. It's not like it's one, but I found this. Um, I was flying back from England, I believe, and I was at Heathrow Airport. <laughs> And for whatever reason, I'm pretty sure I was, or maybe I was traveling with my wife. I was somewhere Mm. and I was like, oh, this looks thick. And and you want to know the other thing is um, if if it's a series and it's only the first book, I'm not going to read it. Mm. But if there's more books in the series, I was like, this must be good enough that people like it enough to publish everything. So the fact that you had all three in there, I was like, oh my gosh, let's do this. And it's... Uh, I've read it, I think, two or three times now. And um, and it's just a great book. It's a great series. The worlds you create are bananas, especially if you like a fantasy, if you like really complex worlds mixed with magic, uh, politics. And it's not like a shallow... Like y- You give the reasons why characters do what they do. I was reading another book a few weeks ago and I was just like, I just couldn't get into it because 200 pages in, I'm like, I still don't understand why any character is doing anything. Like There's zero motivation here. And... It's cool, but it bothers me that I have no idea why anyone is doing anything. That's not the case in your world. Right. Yes. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's a lot of art that goes into making the art invisible, as I'm sure you know. So, Brent, uh, I do have one more question for you. But before I ask that, let me ask you what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Um, so, I obviously I have a webpage, brentwicks.com. I'm, I'm on Facebook. You know, just slash Brent Wakes um, or Brent Wakes author, uh, and I'm on Twitter. You know, at Brent Wakes. So I'm I'm fairly accessible. Sorry to all those other Brent Wakeses. I found out there's about 20 of them in the U.S. It's like that must suck for you guys. I wonder if you, yeah, yeah. So so I apologize to those guys every once in a while for the weird emails they probably get every now and then. But yeah, I'm uh, Brent Wakes. You can pretty much find me on Amazon or or any of those places where where fine books are sold, uh, and, and they're still sold as books even. But they're still sold uh, as books. Yeah, for, for the <laughs> I'm being. <laughs> so final question for you. At the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Um, I think it, it comes down to connecting to what you're passionate about and sharing it with people. It's life is is difficult for us. We all run into patches that are that are really rough. And yet 
we can lighten other people's burdens. So, so the way I have been given to do that is, is by giving stories, by giving fictional examples of people dealing with real problems in ways that are entertaining and fun, but yet leave you, uh, with some hope, leave you with some, some sense that like, people do this people make this people make it through things that are this hard and i can too 